Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> I think uh, this panel will try to clarify some of the matters that have been brought up previously. Thanks to you guys. And um, this is in English also. Uh, we will deal with information as well, but also how information is made accessible to a greater audience through data visualization. Uh, we have here two very interesting projects. May I introduce um, on my far right, this is Andreas Schneider of the Institute for Information Design Japan from Tokyo. On my right, this is Sean Bonner of safecast.org from LA. I'm Verena Daurer. And we will talk about uh, radiation mapping, meaning the um, gathering of uh, radioactive data, of radioactive measurements from certain spots in different places in Japan, all sorts of areas. And um, these two projects uh, have like different approaches. And Andrea's project is uh, mainly using data from the government to visualize. And Sean's project, Safecast, is um, emerged from the hackerspace culture, also is um, crowdsourced, and uh, as I believe is going global. So I think these big differences will be uh, points for our discussion later. So I would start that you would introduce your projects and then we will have a conversation. If at any point you want to um, ask something, please let us know. It would like I would like you to join us. Uh, so please, Sean, um, tell us about your project, please. Sure. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thanks very much. Um, Is it on? Yeah, 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 it's on. I was just tangled. I'm untangled now. All set. OK, uh, hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about Safecast. And I think um, presentations are generally pretty boring, um, especially mine. So I'm going to try to run through this really quickly. But if anything um, seems interesting, like you know, it, feel free to interrupt or whatever, and then we'll get to conversation soon uh, as well. So, OK, so um, maybe you've heard there was this earthquake in, in March. Um, and some things started happening. So immediately, uh, I was in Los Angeles. I had a friend, actually, sorry, this slide is incorrect. Joey was in Boston, not in Dubai at, at this time. But Joey has a lot of family in Tokyo. Um, Joey Ito. Yeah, Joey Ito. I'm pointing at my screen, which you can't see. I should point up there. <laughs> right here, this. OK, so yeah, um, backwards. Joey, Peter. Um, so Peter lives in Tokyo and has lots of family in Tokyo and all over the country. Uh, Joey um, sort of lives uh, everywhere, but he has lots of family in, in Japan as well. And I have lots of friends in Japan. So as soon as this earthquake happened, as soon as things started happening with a nuclear reactor, we started emailing uh, just, you know, is everybody safe? Does everybody know what's going on? Have you, have you touched, touched base with your family? Um, oh, there's radiation going on. Can we find out what's going on with that? And so this email chain just sort of started pulling in people, um, you know, as, as we were talking and somebody else uh, might have more information on it. So, you know, we pulled in, pulled in uh, some people who knew more about uh, radiation. There's some professors from Keough University up there. Uh, the guy on the far left um, designs Geiger counters. Then we have a hardware engineer, Bunny, here in the middle. Um, some hacker spaces we pulled in to see how you guys could, how they could actually build some stuff. Um, we talked to some data visualization people. We pulled in some some web people who were mapping some things. So we sort of really quickly got a, a, a good group of people together who were focused on some individual aspect of this and started pulling them together to see what, what we could do um, and what the problems were. So it, pretty clear the problem immediately was that people didn't have any information. So we thought, well, we'll just go ahead and grab all this information and put it together for people. But the data didn't exist at all. We were looking and there just there was no data available. So we thought, well, okay, we'll just go get a whole bunch of devices, give them to people, and then we'll we'll create this data and then we'll we'll be fine. Um, but the problem was the devices didn't exist either, um, because prior to prior to March, um, there was really not really a big market for radiation monitoring or detecting at all. If you if your business was selling Geiger counters and and you sold you know ten Geiger counters in a month, you were pretty excited about that. Um, and then after March, you know, the, these folks were getting orders for thousands a day. And uh, they couldn't really keep up with them. Most of the orders were coming from, you know, middle America. Um, so, it, you know, it just it wasn't very useful. And, and so our, our problems ended up larger than we thought initially. So we started talking. We uh, 
over over about three weeks, a month, um, created the, the largest Skype chat in history, I think, because we were just in it 24 hours a day, constantly pulling people in who can answer something. And we finally met in Tokyo at the end of the month, um, all in person, and sat down and decided what, what we were going to do and, and try, try to make this better. And that's when we came up with, uh, with this name SafeCast to sort of brand what we were talking about, because we, we were kind of all over the place, and that gave us a clear focus. So the first thing we did was we started started just hacking things together to see what it, what it was we could actually do. So this was the very first thing we ever did was um, we made an iPhone Geiger counter, and I have one of them here, and that's, that's what this is. And so it's just a little, it's a Geiger counter that, um, this one is different than the one that I have a picture of. This is using an old, like, Russian tube, so it's not quite as good as, as that one up there. Um, but we have a little software that kind of monitors, sorry, there's a picture of my kid. Um, um, yeah, so we have some software which which like tracks. Um, it takes a while to cycle through, so that's not actually the reading. Um, but anyway, you know, we were sort of like, okay, this is Geiger counter technology is simple enough that we can we can wire something into into an iPhone and it'll work pretty well. How accurate is it actually? Oh, well, it depends entirely on the sensor, right? So so this this one is not as accurate as the one that is up here because that's a better sensor, and this this sensor is like 30 years old, but that one is like a year and a half old and, and was like designed. That has a much bigger um, sensor area than this one, so that one's a little bit more accurate than this. But neither of these two are as accurate as this one, which is kind of like an off-the-shelf, which is a much larger sensor um, and can detect much more, much more information. So it, it really depends on the sensor as to how accurate they are, but there's a lot of math and science that goes on inside. Um, <laughs> But you can figure it out. OK, so um, we took these things. And, and rather than just having breadboards, we're trying to figure out how to make some, some circuits on them so people could actually put them together and figure out themselves how these things worked. Um, and and we, we, we teamed up with these guys um, at a company called International Medcom who make these devices. And they said, you know, some, some people in Japan who want to try to find out what's actually going on is probably a better place than um, some people like who want to just like hide out in, in Ohio. So they were like, okay, we're going to give you a whole bunch of these things. So we got a whole bunch, we got pretty much every, every one of these devices that they had available. And this is like, um, like a $600 US uh, sort of retail price. It, it's a very high end Geiger counter. So we got, we got a handful of these and, but not enough to give everybody in Japan one. So uh, what we thought was um, we will figure out a way to rig them to an outside of a car which is what we do with this guy. So this is a little suction cup, and we have a very sensitive, you can sort of, yep, sorry, I'm gonna knock a bunch of crap around. Okay, so you know we cut, we cut this out, and this is a very sensitive mylar, it's not tinfoil, even though it looks like tinfoil. And then um, inside we have, uh, we have like a GPS module, and like an SD card, and um, some batteries, and an Arduino. Um, to sort of keep track. So what this does is it logs a data point every every five seconds when we have it on the car, um, puts a puts a GPS reading with it, and um, logs the data, and then we we collect these huge data sources. So with one device, rather than just taking one reading, we can drive around all day and get like twenty thousand data points across the country. So it worked out pretty good. Um, so we, with that, we started talking to volunteers. We started getting people. Um, try to find people who could who could take these devices and drive around with them. We were driving around ourselves and getting people to go out and do stuff. And with that, um, we were able to get some pretty some pretty good data. And as you can see, we're sort of going from like really zoomed out. You can zoom in. We can go all the way to a street level, and you can sort of go like all the way down the block. And what we found with this that that was most important to us right away was how fast these radiation readings were changing. So the the readings that were being published um, by the government at this point were like one reading for the city. So it'd be like, okay, well, the reading in Tokyo right now is this. Which, you know, we didn't know whether that made sense or not because we didn't really know anything about measuring radiation. But as we could see from here, like, this is one street. Like, here's a house, and there's a house, and there's an next house. And so, like, these, these readings are changing just in a matter of feet. And so, like, you know, on one side of this room, it could be two or three times as much as, as the reading on the other side of the room. So one reading for an entire city, not so helpful. Um, but what we also noticed was that um, this idea of, of radiation sort of radiating out perfectly in a circle from the plant 
um, didn't really make a whole lot of sense either. Um, so we couldn't really get too close at first, but as, as we got closer, the, there's a, like a 20 kilometer evacuation zone and then a 30 kilometer uh, voluntary evacuation zone. It definitely got, it, it got pretty ugly as we got into the 30 kilometer evacuate or uh, voluntary evacuation zone, but we didn't get in, into the main thing at first. And then we got into it and, oh, look at that. Inside of the evacuation zone, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was outside of the evacuation zone, um, <laughs> which was was kind of interesting. And there we drove all the way up to the front door of the plant, and it wasn't it wasn't that bad at all. But hey, look, way outside of the evacuation zone, there's lots of problems. Um, and this is this is this is really interesting because there's actually people who lived really close to the plant who got evacuated outside of this area, and so now they live in in worse areas than where their house is, which they're not allowed to go to. But because nobody had this data beforehand, nobody knew this. I, I mean, maybe, I don't know, there are scientists who probably could have speculated this a bit. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> um, but there was no way for normal citizens to know what the radiation was because they were just getting like, oh, here's the reading for, for you know, like a giant massive area or, or just being told not to worry about it. So with this data, we were able to get really, really precise and see where problems are and, and, and where they aren't, um, which was just as important. But of course, the more the more stuff we we track down, um, the more confusing things got. Everyone wants to know what's safe, what's not safe, um, and and we couldn't even really get straight answers on on what's safe or what's not safe. And so, what, one way that we started mapping things was just to show how how much things changed from March and then and there after, because this data didn't exist beforehand. We can't we don't have the same specific level of granularity of data prior to the earthquake. Um, that we have afterwards, but we have some averages, and so we sort of know that, like, across Japan, sort of the average of the country was probably about about 30 CPM, um, and so we can show um, what's what's higher than 30 CPM now. Um, so people can sort of see, like, okay, this is how much higher the radiation level is now than it was before, and whether that's something to be interested in. And just to just to sort of compare, it's it's 54 CPM in here right now. So. You know, I mean, it, that, but, you know, that, I mean, that's nothing because, like, a, an, a transatlantic flight is, like, 800 CPM. So, you know, it all, it all sort of plays out one way or the other. But nobody really knows too much about radiation. So we've been showing all these different visualizations to try to figure out with, with this data what's going on. And as you can see, it's not, it's not a perfect pretty little circle that radiates out from the plant. At all. How would you explain that uh, because of the wind and well, it, it, lots of different things. There's topography. There's wind. There's rain. There's I mean, it, it, it was gas, you know. So like sometimes it's in a cloud. Sometimes the rain brings it down. Sometimes there's there's all sorts of different meteorological events that that change it. So there's really a number of different things that that would apply to this. Again, I'm not I'm not a, a radiation scientist, so I couldn't I couldn't get very specific on the pieces of it. But there's a lot of speculation on what causes different things and and how it spreads. But um, everybody you know, with a little bit of knowledge of this should know that there's no reason it would have ever gone in a perfect circle. So the, that, that evacuation thing is very suspect. Um, so with that, we've been, we've been trying to, to go around the world as well. So we don't just have Japanese data. Um, if you go to our website, we have uh, data all over Southern California. We have all over sort of North, uh, Northeast um, U.S. right now. We did a bunch um, just, just last month, I, I, did, I spoke at a conference in Ireland and, and mapped some stuff out there. We have some stuff around um, in Europe as well. Um, so we have all these different places. So we're not just showing what's in Japan. We're trying to show globally so you can compare and see, like, what, what does that all actually mean? Um, in addition to these mobile things, we're installing static sensors um, around that will keep repeating the same place over and over again so we can see if there's any change on it, but it's also a little bit longer lasting. Um, and by the end of next month, we should have about 300 of those out all over Japan that are sort of sending us data all the time to give us really good information. All of the data that we're releasing is completely open and free for anybody to use. We're releasing it under under what's called a, a CC0 designation. So there's no um, there's no limits, there's no copyright, there's no restriction. People don't have to pay us to use it. They don't even have to say that they got it from us. It's nice if they do, but um, anybody can take our data. They can cross-reference it their data. They can remap it. They can do all sorts of things. So lots of people are doing that. So um, like Yahoo Japan, on the very front page, they have a map that uses our data. So there's lots of people who are taking the data that we're putting out there and then you know repackaging it and, and displaying it. So that's kind of the idea is to get this data out to people as quick as possible. But radiation monitoring is really confusing because there's there's a, a ton of different ways that it's measured. Um, they're not really easily convertible from one to another. You don't really know what, what they all mean. 
Um, and so there's a lot of education that, that needs to go on just just for people to even understand what, you know, have a reading, but, but what does that even mean? The social impact is a really, really big issue. Um, in the previous panel, you were talking about, you know, like nobody wants to be in Fukushima. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, we, we have a lot of volunteers in Fukushima, and they're not people who can't wait to leave. They're people who want to make it clear that Fukushima is not bad. There's areas of Fukushima that are uh, that are bad, but there's also are, areas of Fukushima that aren't bad at all. And in fact, some of our volunteers are putting together like a, a Fukushima first responders radiation group. So they're putting together all the all the data and information that they've been able to put together, how they responded to stuff, um, so that next time there's a radiation issue any place, they can be the first people who go there and be like, look, we're from Fukushima. We have firsthand knowledge of how this works. You know, we're going to like help you help you get through this. And so there's a very strong community, and there are people who are like very very sort of proud that they're from Fukushima and they want to like fix it and, and you know get get on with everything as opposed to just just getting getting away from it. Um, people keep asking us, you know, how come the government's not doing this? Good question. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we're we're going with people and and we're getting a lot of help. Uh, we have about 150 volunteers on the ground, um, most mostly in Japan right now, um, collecting data and and contributing it to the sites. We have um, just last week we crossed over a million data points on our websites. So we have by far the largest um, collection of any data. Uh, in Japan, um, again, that's that's available for anybody to do anything with. Um, but so these things, like this, was designed in like 1980, and you know you wouldn't really want to like carry this around in your pocket. And and if you want to get the data off this, you have to like read read the reading and then go plug it in someplace. So we're working on a new design um, that's much smaller, uses the same really really fantastic sensor, but is connected, so it'll automatically upload data to the web all the time, so that. Anybody who has one of these will constantly be reporting data around, so, so you don't have to you don't have to con you don't have to consciously think about um, what that is. So this is our first drawing of it. Um, here's a, a little bit more of a better rendering of it. We have some some inputs, um, so we can actually record some other some other data as well if if you wanted. You could record some. We don't have the sensor for it yet, but you could record some sort of air contamination, water contamination, and you could just what what's in the stuff around you. You know, we don't we don't. As we started paying attention to this, we realized that. We don't know about our environments nearly as much. As, you know, there's a lot of stuff around us that we don't know, and so if we have some some interesting uh, sensors that we can sort of put this together and, and learn more about our environments around us. So here's the first 3D print of the of the prototype of the device. So this should be available maybe um, by the beginning of next year, um, and uh, and should be really helpful if we get a whole bunch of these out there and get tons more data in. Um, and the more data we have, the better. Um, so our next steps that we're just trying to do is map the rest of the planet, like at every every place of it that we possibly can, so we, so we know a baseline, because if we had the data that we have now from before, we would know a lot more about it, but we don't. Um, so that's a good step. We're trying to figure out food stuff. We're trying to figure out soil. There's lot, lots of questions, more questions than answers, but we're, we're working on it and trying to get a little bits of it. So How will you finance this, by the way? Uh, well, so we uh, right away we did a Kickstarter, um, and we raised about 40,000 US uh, with Kickstarter. We got some donations from a couple of Japanese companies uh, who gave us some money and said, here, go go do the right thing with that. And then just, just last week, we announced we got a Knight Foundation grant to help pay for, for a lot of this. So um, we have a, a lot of people who are, who are very supportive in, in helping out. Um, and so that, that, that's getting us in motion, and then we'll see what happens. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe if you have questions after Andrea's presentation. <laughs> uh, we didn't uh, synchronize or uh, coordinate our presentations. <laughs> so there's certainly some overlaps. Um, we come from a different sort of different background or different sort of starting point. Um, we have been in Tokyo at the time of the earthquake. And if I say we, then I'm I mean, the Institute of Information Design, it's a small group of people, like four at the time. And we were uh, working our offices in an old building, so uh, we were very frightened about the earthquake and uh, the effect on the building it would have. That's also a reminder that if we talk about Fukushima, uh, we should not forget that actually 25 or 28, people, 28 million people died further up north. So using Fukushima as a sort of focus is also a little bit uh, dangerous in a, in a way. I mean, it, 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 uh, we risk limiting our focus 
on an issue which is, of course, very uh, sort of uh, placative because it's sort of not tangible and we, we're sort of worried. We don't really know what to do with it. But at the same time, there's real uh, damage happening or happened uh, further up north and we shouldn't forget about these people. Saying that, what I'm showing is focusing on Fukushima and the, and the, and the effects of the uh, uh, accident at the Fukushima power plant. Uh, so we were worried, and of course we were worried uh, even more, not only about the earthquake, but when the uh, 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 Fukushima accident happened, like how does this radiation uh, affect us and what does it mean? Uh, so the first thing was to look up on the map where is Fukushima in relation to Tokyo, how far is it? And also, like you mentioned the other data, like wind and weather conditions, like what to expect from that. There was no information, as you say, as we all know, the only information at the time, it looked almost like that a few days after the uh, accident, and it didn't change much. That's the official map from the, uh, uh, from the Ministry for uh, Science, uh, Sports, Education. And, I mean, it's a long name, sorry. It's, it will be in the presentation. I think you can download the file. Uh, so if you look at the, at the labels here, there's no, no need for attention anywhere in Japan. It's a green place. Uh, there are a lot of blue uh, spots, which are all fine, and there's only one pink. At the time, there were two spots. This is actually Fukushima here. Uh, that was for many months pink, means under survey, no data. And that's actually even true uh, today in many cases. That's a, a printout of a regular uh, graphic in a newspaper um, uh, where you see there's a Fukushima, but there's no data to, to, the, to the plant. There's only one data to the sort of center here where it says Fukushima Prefecture, which is like Berlin and a mean value in 1.01. Uh, in given in whatever mic measure that is, it's most probably microsievert here. But that's not true. I mean, there are levels which are much higher than that. And just taking the mean value doesn't make any sense, as he pointed out already. We don't know how many measuring stations are, where are those stations, and so forth. So our first um, reaction was like, because by profession we do information design, we are concerned how to communicate in a proper way to people who need or ask for information in a way that they can uh, act upon that. So, but at the same time, we were very frightened. We were sort of in an unnormal state. We were sort of, we couldn't concentrate. We had nightmares, couldn't sleep, and so forth. So, very emotional state. We were not able to rationalize properly. So, we did some sort of crowdsourcing, but it's sort of channel crowdsourcing. We used our own database of 4,000 uh, friends or, or contacts we have and mailed out a standardized mail where we had four uh, questions here. Like, first question, because it popped up in a newspaper with so many CPM or so many gray or so. So what does these measurements actually mean? And how do they relate to each other? Uh, we didn't know. But we also wouldn't have the time, wouldn't have the, the, the mind to investigate to, to uh, these. So we sending them out to people abroad outside of Japan. Please tell us, uh, what are the radiation levels in any part of the country? There were no data available. There were no visualizations. What are the expected levels? Like, how does that change? And finally, what are the options to act or move? Like, would you need to leave the country? Would you need to leave? For me personally, it was a clear, very clear uh, possibility that Tokyo was gone. I couldn't come back to that city. It's a very sad, very, very, very heavy experience, but it was real. Uh, difficult to rem uh, remember now because uh, after like six months or seven months, things settled. But at the time, that was a, a real option. Uh, then we uh, put some constraint to the answers we expected, like it needs to be accessible. So like it doesn't need, we, we, we don't want to have like long treaties, academic treaties on radiation and so forth. It needs to be in a form that we can, that normal people can understand it. Also means it needs to be Japanese. Um, it needs to be understandable and it needs to be usable by non-experts. Um, uh, in order to sort of organize these um, uh, responses, we set up a blog which is um, uh, here, it's called the uh, jcividgnet.blog, where we sort of collect a different type of, in a very sort of uh, open way, we were open for all sort of input. Um, it's still running, but not very, uh, not maintained very well. We got some, some feedback, but much less feedback than we expected. So I think your approach to really put it in the crowd, much, probably much more efficient in reach respect. So, but we understood we need to do something anyway. So we started collecting these data, looking where the different and government started, local governments, uh, uh, prefectural governments started to publish data, but in all different formats. Some, most of them were not accessible, means like they were in, in, in uh, cryptical 
uh, files hidden somewhere, changing the file names, changing location on the server every day. So the only way to get to this data was in the beginning to manually search. And manually search means you need to be able to read Japanese, you need to be able to understand the sort of uh, organization of these websites. But by uh, slowly and slowly, we started to develop uh, the software to, to, to capture this data. And at the moment, it's like 25 sites, official sites. So that's a big difference. N none of them is sort of a private uh, or a, 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 a sort of non-government orgs. These are all government um, um, uh, organiz uh, sites where we take the data from. So we know, we don't say we trust, we don't say this data is true data. <laughs> we give a proper credit. And we know that the situation as it is even now, seven months, is not acceptable because the data we get from Fukushima, from the power plant itself, comes from TEPCO, not from, even from the government. The government gets the data from TEPCO. So it's like when somebody burgles your house, you go to the police, police calls the burglar and asks the burglar to make a report on whatever he did there. <laughs> and that's the situation, and that's really not, uh, not, uh, not acceptable, but we don't have any other choice. And even today, the data from TEPCO is the only, one of the two data which we need to update manually each day uh, because they provide it in a format which is not uh, uh, machine readable. But how is this possible? I mean, yeah. why is the government giving out no proper data? Why Actually, it's not only government, it's also universities. I know that the universities advised or uh, asked their staff not to do any measurement. That the Tokyo University, one of the most respected universities with a lot of uh, engineering uh, departments, um, they, after weeks or even months, they started publishing data from their uh, campuses, but they didn't publish the most uh, critical data, I mean, the highest level data, which most probably comes from a test reactor they have on the site. Um, and on the website, and, and basically the way they publish is just horrendous, it's just a list of numbers. And they say, uh, sorry, this, this post cannot be published because of an, a network uh, connection issue. So I cannot make any assessment. That's just the situation. So we know the situation in that regard is bad. But still, we managed to get like 430 locations, which are updated sometimes hourly, sometimes 10 minutes wise. But we update on the site only hourly. Um, the, uh, uh, the manual data is from the Fukushima plant itself, which is the, still the highest level, and from the Onogawa nuclear power plant, which is north of Fukushima, which now becomes more and more to become a critic. I mean, to get a critical plant, because everything worked perfectly there. Even, I mean, it's in the area of the tsunami, but because this power plant was built at a higher location, now the industry sort of uses it as a, as, a, as, a, as a case, saying, actually, if we do our job properly, no problem. There was no issue on our power plant. Everything works fine. And so population around that plant gets sort of positive again. Um, so yet they don't publish the data in a proper way. It's a, a, a JPEG file they publish <laughs> every day, so we need to read the JPEG file and get out the numbers. Numbers don't change, actually, on that JPEG file, which is rather strange. It's always, 100, <laughs> it's always 120, like for weeks, months now. Uh, calling them up, they wouldn't uh, be able to explain it. They say, no, this is proper measurement, and that's how it is then on our side. So it doesn't make sense. And still, we do publish it, giving the proper credit to it. We don't, make, we don't uh, take any party in that. But how is this all possible? Is there no third party, like neutral? party who's kind of who monitoring? Who could be neutral? Who would that be? Okay, that's uh, difficult. Yeah, we tried to, we tried to uh, partner in the very beginning with, this, for example, the German uh, uh, TÜV. Everybody knows most probably. It's a technical Überwachungsverein. Uh, it's a company, private company, which does sort of technical assessments. Germany, most people know it by the car checking. Uh, every two years or three years, I don't remember that. Um, but they do all sort of technical assessments on, on, on stuff. And they are also have a big uh, operation in, in Japan and do a lot. And they, they also started taking measurements quite early, uh, mostly commercial, but on schools and companies and such. Uh, and initially, they were very interested to work together, but then they sort of ho ho held off. So, so it's so a political decision, I guess. Mm. You talked about the measurements. That's clear different measurements, even between us. He talks about CPM. I don't know what CPM means. I forgot about it. I mean, I know what it means, but I couldn't relate it. We use this, uh, uh, gray or sievert, which is sort of a dose unit, which sort of is an expression of how it affects the body, the, the human body. So it's not a technical only issue. It sort of takes into account the different effect of different radiation on, on the body as such. However, it was interesting from the beginning to observe that initially most of the data were given in nano uh, 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 magnitudes, but that changed rather quickly. So now everybody talks about micro, whatever, micro sievert or micro gray. Basically, they are more or less interchangeable as units. 
to make the numbers also smaller. Because like a normal state in Berlin, you have like 83, 80, 90, 100 or something like that. Highest level in Germany is like in the Black Forest or in uh, uh, Middle Deutschland with 180 or something like that. Nano, nano, of course, nano then. Sorry, of course, nano. But if you, t if you label it in micro, it becomes 0 0.18. It's rather small. But it's also a question of ergonomics. People can't retain such numbers. We think in a design or in, when, you, when you deliver the information, it needs to be ergonomic in a sense that people can retain it and remember it and use it in their comparison, whatever comes up, like uh, um, uh, talking in a different context where people work. We need to put them in context. This was one of the very first diagrams which has been circulating around the web. Even by people sort of trying to be proactively positive, communicative about the issue, they reuse this diagram, which is a very bad diagram coming from the Ministry for, uh, now there's a name, Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. So they do everything. And uh, interesting on that diagram here, atomic nuclear stations are the lowest scale of everything. So then there comes the, uh, the, 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 the lung, uh, the x-ray for lungs. And also, you should know that in Japan, the kids at school, they get, they have to take a, year, a yearly, every year, uh, 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 lung x-ray examination, which, in a way, just to put it in context, might be worse in effect than the radiation we, we, we experience right now. So the effect from the current accident for many kids may be more neglectable than what they experience anyway. But also, and I should say that here, uh, smoking. I mean, we, we are so much uh, observe. I mean, it's not in that diagram, obviously, because also uh, tobacco company is part of the government. JT Tobacco, is part, so they wouldn't put that number here. But as you know, uh, ninety percent uh, uh, of the uh, tobacco uh, death comes from the radiation in the tobacco itself through fertilizers and so on. I don't know if you're aware of that. So it's not about the nicotine as a sort of carcinogenic product. It's about the fertilizer used to cultivate the nicotine. And that's responsible for 90% of the deaths through tobacco. And in Germany alone, every 10 minutes, one person dies. So our concern with the Fukushima through radiation and so such is very important. And I don't want to play it down. But we also need to put it in context how, how it, uh, what it means in other situations. That's another uh, uh, attempt to put it in context. If you take the Berlin TV tower, the whole uh, height of it, which is about 368 meters, I think, and if you think, if you assume that th that is the current measure uh, level of radiation in Fukushima at the uh, south gate, like the only published location uh, of at the plant, which is currently around 300 uh, micro uh, sievert, so it's 300,000 nano sievert. If you take that uh, and compare that to the normal level now in Tokyo, and the pre-accident level is pretty much in that air range as well, it would be like a credit card size. So. It, Imagine you're standing at the bottom of the TV tower, you have a credit card, that's normal level. And the height of the uh, 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 level we have in, in, in Fukushima is like the, the height of the TV tower. But also the level is uh, lower than in, in Berlin, actually, I thought. Yeah, it's 50, around 50, mm. and it's more or less uh, 60, 50. So it's more or less like the pre-accident levels, I think. Another thing to, 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 to be aware of, and that relates a little bit to the uh, uh, argument or the, the comment we had before, there was like a few weeks back in the NTV German news, Kurz vor Evakuierungsgrenze Teile Tokyos Radioaktiv Seuch. That was on uh, October 13th. And uh, the story behind that, I don't know if you followed up on that story. I don't know how many of you heard that, that, that or read that news. But the follow up on that story was indeed it was very high level. But what it was, is there was a, box, a house, a private house in a, in a sort of um, residential area where somebody had a box of radium paint, like, you know, the phosphor, phosphor paint you all, I mean, people had before on the watches. So there was a, this, this box of paint, uh, glasses, uh, flasks hidden in that house, and that raided out, out of the house. So this only became public because people now are able to do measurements. And so that's also an interesting aspect, I think. Like the more people sort of are enabled to do something, how do we cope with what we get? How do we put it into proper context? Uh, now this is a local picture here. It's from Berlin. Many, I don't know if anybody knows this place, but this is in uh, Köpenigarli. I don't know how you, do you call that Karlsholz or so. So you know, former east of Berlin. Um, I don't show the uh, uh, neighborhood around it. It looks like Chernobyl a little bit. But that's the house uh, room in that thing. That's the Bundesamt für Strahlenschutz. That's the government. That's a federal office. office for radiation protection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have a chamber. And I think it's most uh, the best chamber you find in Germany. 
to measure uh, the radiation of people. In the, it's highly shielded, the whole building is shielded with copper walls, and the, the, this room is shielded with a 10 centimeter thick uh, iron wall from iron taken from ships which, have, which, which drowned before the Second World War because you can't use current iron, it's polluted. So in order to reduce uh, background radiation, they built this chamber, and I've, I went there yesterday, uh, and I took a, a radiation checkup, the result is zero. So uh, I'm quite relieved on that. But it was 20 minutes sitting, 20 minutes lying there, and uh, it was quite an important um, um, moment, not for myself so much to be there, but the fact that many people in Japan, they don't have this ability, that possibility to do these measurements. So stress continues, worries continue, not about themselves only, but also about their kids. It was mentioned the food becomes more and more an issue. Um, so if people had a proper way to see like what's actually happening to their body, I think that would be very important to have. Now, another thing to put things into context is like, how does it look in the other parts of the world? And I think it's great that uh, Safecast goes global. Uh, because when uh, we had the first increase in Tokyo from 50, 60, 280, 200, 240, I got shocked and frightened and, and panicked because that was four times the normal value. And I think four times, wow, that's really bad. I didn't know at the time that actually the, the level in Germany, and this is like what we did also, the, the taking up the, uh, again, government measurement stations, very dense network in Germany, um, uh, is... <coughs> In Munich, for example, 190, 180 could be there. And as I said before, Black Forest, similar. So that's actually normal levels. I didn't know about that. So it would be quite helpful to know about these things to sort of contextualize uh, your own uh, understanding of these numbers. So another big issue, and you, you, you showed it quite nicely on, on one of your slides, how do you use colors? And uh, very difficult uh, issue because we cannot avoid making any statement by using colors. Um, I showed briefly one of the websites on, on our blog, which has been done by um, a design company called uh, uh, Nippon Design Center. They do Muji, Muji design. I think you all know Muji. So it's all white. The whole map is sort of whitish. It turns out this company works for TEPCO. They did the logo. And they, they, they say, we, won't, we, don't want, we don't want to make any assessment. We just use neutral colors. So we use these colors. Uh, we need to use these colors. And then you see the difference here. This is a government side where even the, the sort of uh, heavy po uh, points are green, and we try to give it a sort of continuous uh, tint to make it um, readable, understandable. Now, time is running short, so keep it. Uh, I think we had like a 2D map, like we tried to make it a 3D map, uh, because I think it's important to, to navigate around these maps, uh, because that will show you um, much more. I mean, that will give you an ability to uh, see like how, how this actually uh, I mean, what it actually means, and already uh, Sean mentioned that even you have this uh, ev evacuation zone, there are areas which are not very much polluted, but you wouldn't understand that unless you actually just uh, go around it and, and, and see it. Um, then uh, what, we are do what we are concerned uh, with now is like what, what could be uh, uh, the next uh, step and beyond monitoring and probably going in a similar direction. Like we, we understood we need to involve other people, uh, people, and so this is sort of some scenarios where talk with farmers, talk with people uh, working in kindergartens or schools, and talk with people who, 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 who sell food, for example. And each of them, they have different uh, needs and, uh, and, and constraints and requirements. And so we try to uh, understand these factors and from there develop some solutions, but that's still up. The most important question I have, like what happens in other parts of the world? Somebody mentioned that China, uh, India, Vietnam, they all need and can. So it's a great opportunity to learn from what happened in Fukushima. And we need to, foc we need to shift and open up our focus from Fukushima to look really at the other parts and become active in, 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 in using best what we, what, what we understood from Fukushima. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think so far I see two issues. One is like the one of the standards and the other one is putting the numbers into context. Um, are there any questions about understanding? Anything you want to comment on? No? I mean, I would be interested... Oh, yes, please. 
So I have an, indeed two questions. Uh, one question concerning how to participate in SafeCast. Is this that everyone has to buy his own device or can it order from uh, your community? And the other question is the last device you showed us up, is this um, appropriate for scanning or measuring of other kind of pollution than only radiation? So because the idea, you, I can think further, or I, I thought further in, for uh, this idea, and um, yeah, maybe you can use it as like a tricorder to, to map all world um, pollution. Yeah, that, that's kind of our plan. <laughs> okay. so, um, so right now, um, the problem is that the devices are, are very short. As soon as, they, as soon as they're made, they're sold. So we're getting, we're getting them kind of the second they roll off the production line. There's not really a new stock. If you order um, a device like, like, this, like this guy, if you order this from, from International Medcom right now, there's like a nine month wait for before before they would be able to give it to you. So the the supply on them is still very low. Um, they're working with their manufacturers. That you know the supply chain is trying to trying to deal with the increased demand. So hopefully that will get better. There um, there's been sort of a flood in the market of really bad devices all over Japan. There's really expensive devices that are coming in from China that are using old Russian tubes, um, some some like bootleg Chinese tubes that that don't don't pick up right stuff, and some of them are, are completely shielded. We we have um, some video uh, that was that was published where where somebody has has a device that looks very similar to this, with the exception of a giant plate of lead on the back of it, which would cover any kind of sensor that was on it, and they're and they're and they're going, look, the the radiation is zero here. We're fine. There's nothing to worry about, and so um, there's just there's not a lot of understanding of how the devices work, what's in the devices or whatever. So um, I would say right now your your options for getting a really good device are very slim, but hopefully that will be very, that will be corrected very soon and, and over the next few months that, that supply chain will, will get improved. The devices that, that we have designed, we open source the design so other people can make it. Medcom is going to moving ahead on the design uh, on the production right now, but it will be available for other people to sort of follow suit. And part of it is that it does have inputs. Um, for other sorts of sensors. So you could attach an air sensor to it. You could attach a water sensor to it. You could attach other kinds of sensors, and then that data would also get sent, and then we can start mapping and, and keeping track of all that as well. And uh, everyone has to pay itself. Yeah? It's not sponsored by any company. No, I, no, or, I mean, no. ideally, we're going to get them made and then try to get them out. But no, there's nobody sponsoring any of it. I mean, we're, we're paying or people are raising money for every bit of it. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. I mean, right now, we've given away tons of devices. So we'll, we'll continue to try. Yeah. Yes, it's a comment directly on that. Oh, hold on. So just briefly. Yeah, very briefly. Just, just to expand on that a little bit. I mean, fundamentally what you need is a sensor of some type, whatever it is you're trying to measure, uh, a network connection, and a place to put the data, right? And these guys have concentrated on radiation right now with the Geiger uh, sensor. They've got a back end and a system and everything. But you can do that with anything. And the design for the for the new device has an API where you can have any other sensor that goes into that and piggybacks on the rest of the stack. That's basically part of the, the, the idea there. Yeah. Just as a matter of interest, uh, does anybody of you have any records on how the radiation spread uh, into other countries, for, for it, instance, across uh, the sea to North America well, or, or uh, into China? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But I mean, that, that's the point is like with, you know, little bits of it, it's everywhere. I mean, the same thing is like, you know, um, as Andreas mentioned with the, with that room that was built with, with pre-World War II steel because everything after World War II is contaminated. We got samples tested at a lab in Berkeley that the room is constructed with pre-World War II concrete because every piece of concrete after World War II is contaminated with, with Hiroshima. So... The, I mean, any time there's an event of this magnitude, it's everywhere. So you can you can detect. I mean, we've had particles detected in Boston. We've had particles detected in Los Angeles. It's everywhere. But I mean, what does that mean? It means nothing because it's like you know one one particle in an entire room is nothing. It's it's nothing, but it's everywhere. I mean, it's it's in the environment. And it'll be there for forever. Can I just second a little bit to that? Uh, <laughs> it's not only about Hiroshima. It's also about uh, uh, nuclear uh, tests. Weapon right. tests in the 50s, 60s, and we, grown up in the 50s, 60s, uh, eating ch as children eating that food, we all have that issue, and it's documented, like the curve we had, uh, which affected us in, 
in our childhood, it was only not known or it was not made public at the time. We have a question from Twitter. Um, I just saw it. It was. Uh, yes. uh, has anyone tried to reach out to politics to make them change data publishing policies? <laughs> well. Yes, I sent many. I, I'm sorry, I sent many emails to Mr. Khan, the Prime Minister of Japan, but uh, only got a, a polite reply. Thank you for we received your email. Yeah, but how's the general public dealing with this? I mean, there must be some efforts. Yeah, well, if you if you if you look on YouTube, um, there are a considerable number of videos from sort of uh, like prefecture meetings and neighborhood council, not neighborhood councils, but you know, like the the, uh, the appropriate translation, um, where where people are demanding of their officials to give them more accurate information, and the officials are basically saying no. So yeah, I mean, th there's efforts, but. They're falling on deaf ears completely. There's, uh, there's not really any interest, as far as we can tell, um, other than them saying, yes, there's interest. But there, uh, any actions are not showing any interest in actually showing more precise data. So does this imply TEPCO is too strong as a lobby for the country? Or why is, what's the reason? Maybe? Actually, I would like to put that a little bit in. Uh, I would uh, relativize that a little bit. Um, I don't know how you read or how you read the government navigation after the crisis, but I think there's a big shift in the government. There was a big shift. There was certainly a big shift with the Khan, the prime, former prime minister, which was portrayed in the media as a uh, lackluster leader or so, didn't do his proper job and so forth. But actually, matter of fact, 80% of the power stations are off in Japan. I don't know if you can compare that to the current situation in Germany. In spite of all the talk, yes, we, we stop the thing. But how many percent are actually off in Germany? I don't know, don't know the numbers. Matter of fact, 80% in Japan are off. And it could well be that in spring, all of them are off. Because the policy, uh, the requirement is that each of the power stations needs to get a maintenance once a year. And for that, normally they shut down for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Now, none of them, which was shut down, is restarted. And that might well continue. So it's very difficult to read the politics because on the surface, they might behave and even talk at times. OK, yes, we do. And so, But actually, there's a much more subtle uh, sub uh, draft to make sure they won't be uh, started. Now we have these sort of stress tests, and it's two-level stress tests they need to go through. And these stress tests are so hard that it might be, might be possible. I, I only say might be possible. I hope it will be. That they won't get, uh, none of them will be, uh, will get restarted. Do you have any questions, comments? Oh, over there. Yes, I, f I found some information about the last days uh, about Tokyo. I mean, the last one was a supermarket. Uh, uh, and I was interested if the safe cast measuring is already up to date and say something about it. Yeah, it's not noteworthy. We we reported all of the hotspots in Tokyo five months ago, six months ago. There, there, it's nothing. It's nothing. I mean, it's it's nothing noteworthy. The the hottest spot is near Chiba, um, but that's also just you know two or three times what it is elsewhere. So I mean, that this kind of like. Panic mm -hmm. that's come around recently about oh my gosh Tokyo it's it's not even it's not even noteworthy of anything. Yeah, There's it's, it's not only about panic; it's about a kind of a one method of of figuring out what's true or not. Or what, no, I know. But it's, what yeah. I mean is is that the the stuff that's showing up on maps now has been on our maps for for four months. Yeah, and you do, but you have reason measurings as well. No, you see, if you go in a supermarket and you go, let's say, you go in an outdoor market. And you, 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 you look at uh, some simple thing like a, a, a mesh for your gas lantern on your tent. If you measure this mesh with this device, it will show like 3,000 or 5,000 CPM. And everybody, everybody could start, wow, that's a big issue. No, it's not and about that. So These we need to be official. precise. And if you have a good number, precise number, like what has been measured, to what level had it, has it been measured, to what area has it been measured, then I think we can discuss about it. Yeah, but I have, otherwise, I have it's it just here. I can't now explain you. But mm. I, I, of course, it was published in, in the main uh, sure, newspapers. The media, we know that the media I mean, don't publish properly. You see, I, the Spiegel, I, there was a guy from Spiegel before, they published highly, re highly poisonous plutonium found in Fukushima. That's a true statement. It turned out that the, the number, the amount of that uh, plutonium found there was so minute that you could even suspect that it was a trace of the former weapon uh, testing. 
yeah, yeah, it might be, it might, it might yeah, okay. So, I, I, as a, yeah, it's no, it's good, okay, thank you. As, as a follow-up to that, I'm, I'm curious, um, for both of you, to what degree you've seen your work reflected in, in the work of professional journalists? I mean, ha has it been picked up widely and written about? And I, I would hope so. Yeah, I mean, we, our work at SafeCast has been covered extensively on a global level. It hasn't been reported uh, too extensively inside of Japan, um, but we've we've had a, a significant amount of coverage elsewhere. How about, how about yes, your situation? Uh, actually, very poor, I would say. Uh, within, I can only support that within Japan, there's no no pickup. I mean, we, of course, we contact actively in the newspapers and media. Uh, throws out like this is something you should be afraid of people get really afraid of it you know and so like if you look at like in the US the response to terrorism you know like versus the actual threat mm -hmm. you know and so like there's there's constantly like no context for anything and it's really hard to <laughs> to draw draw a comparison on things um, yeah, but how to make visualizations in a way that they don't instigate fear? I mean, should there be any right. standards or any like? Well, part you know, part of that falls in into saying what's safe and what's not, which which is a very confusing topic. And in inside of health physics, there's not even agreement of like what is safe and what isn't safe. You know, if we're talking about Japan, um, previously the um, uh, the the annual exposure rate for a normal citizen was one microsievert, and then. Um, yeah. One, sorry, one millisievert. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, exposure limit for a radiation worker was 10 millisieverts. And then after this event, they've changed it to um, if you live in Fukushima, then the annual exposure limit is 20 millisieverts. So like, how, how is it that, that something that this was the limit is what's safe, now all of a sudden 20 times that is still safe? You know, it, there's, there's no agreement on a global level of this is safe and that's not safe. So a lot of it is interpretive regardless. And it's very hard to display data that you're trying to convey. Is this good? Is this bad? When there's no agreement on that anywhere. I think some of what we say may sound to you like appeasement. But uh, I personally think this is important to be sober and to be, I mean, clear and don't get confused with emotions. Uh, what he said, like with the 20 millimeters, that's true. But also we need to say it was changed back to one millisievert again after a short few weeks. Uh, food, for example, food levels, they have been lower, I mean, they, uh, they have been higher in Europe than the levels in, in Japan, but they have been adapted in Europe to the lower level in order to make, to, to, I mean, make it not possible. That event, in a way, is quite a positive, I mean, has quite some positive uh, consequences. I would like to know, um, since you're working with a lot of volunteers, do you have any standards how to make reliable data? Do you train them or do you have a catalog of lists you can apply? Well, I mean, the devices are, are fairly foolproof. You know, I mean, there, there's not there's not a lot of interpretation that's going on because the data is coming off the device and being logged into a file, and then they're just sending us the file. So there there's not much uh, for for like human error to go in that as long as they, you know, take the take the reading and put the device in the right place. And so we spend we spend you know a half hour an hour with with each person that we give a device to, show them how it works, what they need to do, and and go through it. Um, and then, you know, because we have so many kind of circling now, we sort of know what things are looking like and where they should. And, um, you know, we're filling in, in gaps on the map, but, but people are constantly covering the same areas. And so if something was off, we would notice it, you know, if it was outside of what's coming in from other places and everything's kind of working correctly. So because we have a small group and a small, I say small relatively, I mean, 150 people is, is a lot of, a lot of folks, but it's not millions of people. So, um, we can sort of pay attention and, and that, and it's been pretty simple. There's a question over there, please. Yeah. Uh, when do you think that uh, many people will start uh, getting sick and will they be taken care of um, properly? And will there be some cover up of that, do you think? Or kind I mean, that's, of, that's a very political you know? question. I have no yeah. idea. I mean, there's still, they're still not. There's still no agreement about people who who got sick from um, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island whether whether there were you know you can argue that 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 was you know actually caused by anything. There there's huge debate over that. So what will happen? We have no idea. But we do know that we don't we didn't have the kind of data that we have now for any of these previous events. 
So now we have much more data. And so next time something happens, we have a better starting point than what we had now. Can, can I ask, uh, so, can, so, I, can I, I haven't been here for this whole conversation, but uh, I wanted to ask what your, uh, what your platform is regarding the uh, after effects of TMI and Chernobyl and whether you align yourselves with, uh, say, uh, some of these independent uh, commissions that exist in Europe for uh, doing risk projection or, say, uh, like Chris Busby and people who are aligned with Greenpeace and whatnot? We're or? not aligned with anybody, decidedly. We're, we're pro-data. Okay. And we're not, we're not, no, literally, we're not, we're not anti-nuke, we're not pro-nuke, we're not anything, we're not, we're not associated with any other organization, very specifically because we don't, we don't want to have any speculation or any tint or anything on it. We're oh, taking okay. readings, data is the data, and that's that. And then the data can be interpreted and cross, you know, analyzed, all sorts of other things, but the data is the data, and that's that. Thank you. However, the thing is, you give the data to the public for free, and everybody can do a visualization, which can be possibly misleading also. I mean, if TEPCO uses your data, what would you do? If that's, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can use our data. Yeah. I would love it if TEPCO used our data, because then they would give out more data than they're giving out right now. <laughs> but they're not. <laughs> I mean, do you imagine, since you were presenting this new prototype device before, that you could collect all sorts of other data and then combine it to, like, maybe an augmented three-dimensional map and maybe if you get access to hospital reports or anything and like piece it all together for well, a I mean, complex that, that, thing. Well, I mean, that's sort of the idea is that we, we create this huge data set and then make it available for anybody to do anything with. Yeah. So um, I, I, I don't want to get into speculating what kind of visualizations we may or may not make because our main goal is collecting data not making visualizations of the data. So, I mean, we, we are trying to make visualizations just because it's a very interesting piece of it, but our, our the very main focus of what we're doing is to get the data. And so, you know, we're making it available to people, so people have other data sets. So I would love it if someone in the medical industry who had that data would cross-reference their data against ours, but that hasn't happened yet. We're talking with some researchers at um, Penn State University who are doing massive data mining of social networks to find people who are talking about ailments and different things and with geotagged like tweets and Facebook posts and they're going to try to cross-reference that against our data. So that, that that is the whole point is that we make this data available to people who have other data and then they can do stuff with it. But literally we want everybody to have our data to do whatever they want with it. Andreas, do you have something to add maybe or? No, it's just about her question about the disease or sickness I and mean, she, she asked about how many what to do with the people getting sick, uh, to your question. I think the concern on my side would be much more on other issues, like bad food you do, you take every day maybe, uh, smoking. Nobody does anything against it. We don't get excited about it. We accept that a few horrible pictures on a tobacco package should be fine. What a nonsense. Nobody gets excited about that sort of nonsense that you print some scaring messages, but still you sell it and make profit. That's complete and utter nonsense. And still we don't get excited. We don't make symposia on that. But radiation it becomes an, it's an issue because it sort of lends itself easily to that issue. I don't want to belittle both of them. It's very important. I'm clearly anti-nuke uh, because I think it's a bad technology. Not, so, not only because of the radiation, but because of all the other impacts and, and, and security issues. And I mean, it's just bad. It just doesn't make sense. But uh, the question should be different, I think, not focused just on radiation. Right. Well, it just seemed to me like it just seemed to me that sickness and you know people seeing large numbers of people actually sick. That's when the awareness goes up internationally. Yes. Skyrockets. But, but, there, but there's been two previous events, and that that didn't happen. So. Well, <laughs> the, the argument of whether it happened or not is, uh, is t definitely open. It's not, that's not closed. So to say it didn't happen. No, no, what I mean is, is that is the awareness, to, is, is the awareness, not, not whether, aside. no, no, I'm not saying. Oh, I, you're saying the awareness didn't. Right. You're, yeah. You said that when lots of people get sick, that's when the awareness goes up. We've had two events, arguably people got sick from the awareness didn't go up. So saying that all of a sudden when everyone gets sick in Japan, now the awareness is going to go up. I, I don't believe that. I mean, it, it happened twice before and the awareness didn't go up. But what, I, I guess a major difference, though, is that we're dealing with um, a, a very large urban center that is uh, one of the 
one of the crowning jewels of this century's Fukushima development. No, Tokyo. Tokyo. Yeah, but Tokyo is like you know 400 kilometers away. I I understand that. 200, 100, 50. I mean, two 200 and something. Radiation levels are higher in Los Angeles than they are in Tokyo, so it's not. <laughs> that is uh, not the information that. I've, I can I've tell seen. you, I measured it. I live in Los Angeles. I've been in Tokyo six times this year. I, I understand. That. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I know. I can tell you. So, I mean, whatever information you have, it's incorrect because I've measured well, it. Well, personally, I. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know firsthand. Well, I'm not. I'm not referring to data well, from elsewhere. Well, um, I'm not refuting your measurements at all. However, um, I lived in Tokyo for three years, sure. and and um, I'm very well connected to activists in that space. So, um, I have other data. I would have to. Source it out. I didn't. I didn't come today prepared. Maybe to you can maybe compare you can the data. Yeah, please do. Just, our, our data. You can go to. You can go to Safecast. You can download our entire data set. I've been watching Safecast from the start. Yeah. So, so download our data, contrast it against your and, stuff, and and find out why it's different. And I, well, it takes a bit. Maybe we can continue on <laughs> this I'm, after. I'm in, I'm in Germany. <laughs> with so coffee I would break like to talk with you more. Though. Yeah. I'm sorry. We have to wrap it up a go bit. Ahead. <laughs> so far, I think this panel has maybe raised more questions. I have the feeling. I still think the context is the one of the important things, and the standards, because there seems to be a lot of fear and unclarity for me, I guess for you as well. Maybe continue outside. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for